What is up, my Squirtleites? It is I, your king, and let's talk April today, shall we? I know this is a bit of a late episode. I try to get these out usually within the first week of any given month. But at this point, I'm just going to have to end that promise because there are just too many things that are constantly going on that make it very hard for me to get these out on time. Not to mention that, like this month and so many months before it, oftentimes I'll go make one and then something will change and then it's like, well, crap, I need to update that now. I don't want to leave people hanging for four weeks and so then I attack more things onto it and then by the time I get around to recording that, more things come up and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is like the fifth time I've tried to record this month's Let's Talk and sometimes that can be really frustrating because these are sort of long <laughs> sometimes, especially this one, as you can see, based on the runtime. I've got a lot to go over. But uh, I think now should be good. I just need to obviously record some random B-roll footage to put up in the background. This is going to be more of the podcasty sort of episode, which I can never decide on whether or not that's what I want Let's Talk to be, whether I want it to just be kind of a monthly update thing or for it to be, you know, a proper podcast thing. And that's not to say we're going to discuss, like, game industry news and any of that stuff. Although I do have something special for the end of this Let's Talk. I do want to give my thoughts and impressions on the Super Mario Brothers movie uh, at the end of this. So stay tuned for that. I Obviously, if that's all you care about, I will have timestamps in the video. You know, you can click around, go to whatever topic you care about, and that'll pretty much make up the last 20, 15 minutes of this Let's Talk. Um, and that's actually something I'm going to be doing a little bit more frequently in these, because next month I would like to also do another review of a, of a video game-related property that came out recently, uh, this time being this first season of The Last of Us, the HBO series. And uh, I will give you a warning, though, that those are going to be a little spoilery. Uh, well, The Last of Us one will for sure be. I'll try to keep the spoilers to an absolute minimum in as far as my Super Mario Brothers impressions, just because it's more recent. And... It's not as much, you know, a direct one-to-one -to, -one to any sort of source material like The Last of Us show is, which means that talking about any of the elements in that in turn inform the elements of the game. Therefore, there are spoilers. <laughs> like, it's one of those things where you can't talk about one without talking about the other in that case. But in the case of Super Mario Brothers, no. It's a completely original thing, just inspired by, obviously, a lot of stuff we already know. And uh, in that way, it's going to be easy to not talk spoilers. But... Uh, yeah, I want to I do that more often. I want to talk about like video game uh, adaptations and properties whenever they come out uh, a little bit more frequently. We you know we got like the Minecraft movie in the future, and then obviously the Amazon show on the horizon, if they're good, of course. Because as of the last couple of years, video game movies and TV shows have been improving significantly. That's not to say any of them have necessarily been amazing. Well, I mean, I, maybe one or two things have been really, really good, but for the most part, they're not amazing, but the bar of quality is certainly a lot higher than it was back in like the 2000s and the 90s, for instance. So there's, a, there's more merit to actually discussing those things now than there would have been, heck, even like five years ago. So let's just jump on in. I'm gonna start with the channel-related stuff, as I always do, uh, going over the current series, first things first. Let's start with the two series that are going to be ending before May 1st, uh, by the end of this month. And those are going to be Pokemon Legends Arceus and Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Legends Arceus's finale goes out on April 27th, and Uncharted The Lost Legacy's finale goes out on April 29th. I didn't plan for them to be that close together, it's just kind of how it worked out. Uncharted The Lost Legacy was always going to be that long. I literally recorded that entire game in one session, edited it in one session, and scheduled it basically all within like the same weekend. Uh, so that just happened to be that long. And Legends Arceus did get extended a little bit because of my last second decision to spend a lot of time focusing on the side quest when I originally didn't plan to do that. But given how comprehensive that series was already turning out to be and the fact that I did end up going for full dex completion, it just made sense to add that on to the, to the well, what was effectively a let's play in the end. It originally wasn't supposed to be when I started the series, but it truly was by the end of the game. And so... Got extended a little bit, but yeah, now that's ending here on the 27th when I first thought it was going to end sometime back in March. So, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss what's coming after Legends Arceus here in a bit, but Uncharted The Lost Legacy is going to be replaced by a different series that I haven't actually discussed up to this point uh, whatsoever. Um, there are two games that we looked at in the variety series, you know, the stuff I put out on Fridays, that I actually want to bring forward into full-length series. 
And it's been on my mind a lot over the last few years because in the early days of my channel, uh, I actually spent a lot of time focusing on two, two types of games. Nintendo games and then usually like artistic indie darlings. You know, I'm talking like the limbos and the journeys of the world. Shadow of the Colossus, you could even say kind of fits in that, even though that game isn't technically an indie game. Stuff like that was my bread and butter when I wasn't just playing Nintendo games. And... Over time, you know, it, the channel got a lot more variety to it. I started to branch out, do more things, go back to a lot of the old PS2 games that I was a fan of growing up, and, and just, just playing various games from my childhood, and then it just turned into, hey, whatever, let's just, no, no holds barred. If I enjoy the game, I'm willing to look at it on the channel. But in doing so, I've kind of let that previous identity sort of fall behind in that I really haven't looked at any interesting indie games over the past few years. Um, I, the closest I would say I've come to that is Kena Bridge of Spirits last year, which itself also, I mean, I, I think it's technically an indie game, but it was a more mid-budget indie game as opposed, as opposed to a low-budget indie game. Um, it it might have even been like a, just a proper third party. I honestly don't know 100% what I would consider that, but it was definitely a higher budget game than like a lot of the stuff I used to look back at. Uh, in the early days of the channel. So I want to start getting back into more of those sorts of games. And there was a few that we looked at back in March that really sort of, I guess, inspired me to sort of take up that cause again and start looking at a lot more of those. And those games were the following, Rhyme, The Talos Principle, and Spirit of the North. And two of those are ones that I'm going to be turning here into series before summer's end. And one of those is going to be replacing Uncharted The Lost Legacy. I'm not going to tell you which just yet, but just FYI, one of those games is... Well, essentially that variety episode is going to act as episode one, and then episode two will be coming out on um, right after Uncharted The Lost Legacy in within its upload slot, and then we'll just go through that. Now, they're not very long games, so it'll be a nice, quick little series. Um, I mean, regardless of which one I pick, Rhyme or Spirit of the North, they're both going to probably be less than 20 episodes. So we'll just kind of hop on into that and enjoy that for a little while before we move on to the next thing, which is something that I'm going to be working on next month. So look forward to that. Now let's talk about NFL Street and Horizon Forbidden West, the two series that are not going to be ending nearly as early as I thought they would because NFL Street, well, I guess I just underestimated its size, and Horizon Forbidden West because it's the game that literally never freaking ends. NFL Street, first things first. Um, I've got, oh man, almost another 20 episodes left to edit, but it is done and fully recorded. Um, all of my current series are done and fully recorded, I should say, but I also say that with a little bit of air quotes around done. Uh, you'll see in a second. Um, NFL Street, I've got all the way through NFL Challenge complete. I am not going to be doing any more than that. That's really all that a playthrough of that game can consist of. Because aside from that, it's just either do one-on-one -on -one versus matches or do one-on-one -on -one versus matches where you pick your teams at the beginning. And those are really the only other modes that the NFL Street 1, at least, has to offer. So once the NFL Challenge is done the series is over, but the NFL Challenge ended up going a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be, and that was mostly due to a difficulty increase towards the later end of the game. Now, I didn't really lose anything. I never had, like, an issue where I ran into challenges that, you know, made, caused, you know, took several episodes, except for one, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it, it wasn't that I was losing, it was just that the matches were getting harder, therefore the games were taking longer, therefore less was getting done on a per episode basis as we hit the higher ends of the difficulty curve because it's a GameCube game. GameCube games still hadn't yet kind of figured out how to properly ramp up the AI, so it just sort of spikes and then the difficulty gets really insane. And while I don't, again, like I said, I don't lose any games, they're no longer the stomps that they were at the beginning. And it, again, it just makes everything take longer. I mean, for most of the series, I was doing, what, two ladder matches per episode. And for a lot of the later ones, it was only one ladder match per episode. So that one ended up going a little longer. It's probably not going to be ending until June. There's also one part in the series to look forward to. Uh, it ended up being a challenge that took two episodes to do, but that's because that is a challenge that is designed to be a marathon, an endurance test, and it also is the highest difficulty challenge in the game. Um, when we get to it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's it, it, There's a reason it took that long. It, it was that long by design. It's not like I failed it or anything. It's just 
it is long, but it's, you know, that's kind of the point of it. And you, you'll get it when we get there. But that one in particular was, whew, wow, that was a doozy and uh, made for some interesting episodes that are very colorful episodes. I'll just put it that way. So I uh, hope you guys are looking forward to that. And that was split into two parts. But aside from that, it was just kind of business as usual all the way through to the NFL Challenge, finishing that up and then saying good goodbye to the series. And when that is over, it will be replaced by Mario Party 1, which I've already gotten fully recorded. Uh, I haven't actually edited any of the episodes yet, but it is fully recorded. It is ready to go. All six boards with all six characters using a different one on each board. And uh, goodness me, that game is evil. <laughs> Mario Party 1 is a messed up game, and the designers behind that are absolute sadists. I mean, like, I knew Mario Party is bad, and it has some crazy RNG, and luck can just absolutely murder you in most of the games, but... Mario Party 1 in particular is just designed in such an evil way where, I mean, the fact that it has mini games where nobody wins, there's just a loser. And like, it just, just it spends time just like punishing people rather than rewarding them. And it's, oh, it's, it's, it's really messed up sometimes, some of the things that that game does. Like, I can't believe how it was designed, that it was designed that way. I speak as somebody who played a lot of Mario Party 2 and 3 growing up, but I almost never played Mario Party 1, so I forgot how horrible that game is. So yeah, that was a lot of fun, but it, it, I still had a fun time. It was, a, it was a blast. A lot of those episodes were very good. I certainly didn't win every board just because of the nature of that game's sadism, but it was a good time. Very good time. So yeah, that's going to be replacing NFL Street, and then I won't talk about what's coming after that. Now, Horizon Forbidden West. Let's talk about that series for a minute. So, like I said, the series that never frickin' ends. I am done, and I, again, I'm going to say this with air quotes, done recording that game through to the credits. I've recorded all the way through to the credits rolling. It is over. It is done with. Again, every single time I say these words, I say it with air quotes because the week that you're getting this Let's Talk, an expansion comes out, The Burning Shores. This expansion is designed to be a post-game expansion, not a, mid, not a mid-game expansion like The Frozen Wilds was for Horizon Zero Dawn. Although I say mid-game, really late mid-game. Frozen Wilds was kind of designed to be something you could do before the finale, but you were heavily encouraged to do it when you were at your absolute strongest uh, before the very last mission. And if you watch my Let's Play, the way I did it was... I did absolutely everything in the game of, of Horizon Zero Dawn, all the side quests, everything there was to do. Then I went on to Frozen Wilds right before the very last main story mission. And I, and I saved that for the last two episodes. So I wish I could have done that with Burning Shores, but it's not designed that way. It is designed to be played once you have beaten the main game. Once the credits roll, once the vanilla game is complete, the developers explicitly said this, so it's something that we're going to be jumping right into after the fact. However, there are also a couple of side things that I did leave for once we came back to the game. Again, quote-unquote, came back. We're not going to really ever leave it um, after the credits roll. And this, these were a lot of the more tedious side quests, like Machine Strike, for instance, which is... Just a lot of board games. <laughs> and uh, then there is the arena, arena challenges, which is something I did a little bit of during the series to grab myself a, a one of the best pieces of armor in the game and one of the better weapons in the game. But I didn't really grab the rest of the weapons and the rest of the armor in it. So there, I, I think I did like a third of all of the challenges. And the other two thirds are still waiting. And the last thing are is a set of challenges we didn't touch at all in the series because, I'm going to be quite honest, I hate them, and they are called gauntlet runs. Gauntlet runs are these races that you do on your machine mounts um, against people, and you're supposed to, well, you're just supposed to win a race. Now, this doesn't sound all that bad except for the fact that mount controls in Horizon Forbidden West suck, or I should say on land mount, patrol, uh, mount controls. The ones in the air are great. I love them. But... On the ground, a lot of them are very frustrating to use, and the way that it interacts with terrain and the physics can be incredibly frustrating at times, and these gauntlet runs are extremely punishing and very difficult, and you have to be pretty much a perfectionist, and I'm just not a fan of them. I'm, I, I, don't, I think the mount controls are serviceable if you're not in a rush, but I, I don't, I've never liked mounts in that game for one thing, just because most things that are around you Aloy can get to on foot anyway not to mention how much terrain you need to climb over in that game and having to constantly get on and off and on and off and on and off to grab things and because you're going to be constantly running into various like machine patrols and human patrols and 
all this sorts of thing. There's there's so much going on in that game that getting on a mount unless you were going in a straight line from one place to another that you for some reason don't need to fast travel to, it's it's a very rare occurrence. So I just I've never been a huge fan of that part of the game. Like it's I'm glad it's there, but I don't personally like it. And then to make an entire set of side quests themed around doing that efficiently is yeah, not my favorite. So I don't even know if we'll go back to those, but I did leave those uh, I did leave those untouched for the majority of the main series. So that is something that's going to be waiting for us. And then, of course, there's the Burning Shores expansion itself. Now, as for what is recorded thus far, Horizon Forbidden West won't be, again, I'm going to say one more time with air quotes, ending until July. However... <laughs> Then there's the Burning Shores, and then there's all the other additional stuff. If I am to be an optimist and pretend that I were to assume that the Burning Shores is as long as the Frozen Wilds was, which I'm almost 100% positive it won't be, then I could say, okay, this whole series will be done in October. However, <laughs> Burning Shores is going to be longer. There's no way it's not. This had a much longer development time than the Frozen Wilds did. It's been hyped up for a whole lot longer by Gorilla, and it's something that's been, you know, they've, they've just put a lot more into. There's a lot more story context to it. It's much more required in the grand scheme of everything that's going on within the game. The Frozen Wilds is sort of a side thing that really doesn't matter to most other aspects of the story. It's just kind of there as like an additional challenge. Horizon Forbidden West, I mean, and don't get me wrong, it has some story implications, but Burning Shores is apparently almost like an interlude between Forbidden West and the next Horizon game. Um, and spoilers, there is going to be a third one, but I, I felt like that was pretty obvious at this, at this point, regardless of whether or not you've played the game. And being that kind of an interlude, it's going to be a longer expansion, which means that this series honestly might not end until December, if not next year. Like, that's how long this series is going to end up going. And all that means is that Destiny isn't going to be coming back for a very long time. And you know what? I think I'm okay with that. It just gives me more time to refine that series and get it all prepared for the future. It also means I don't really have to worry about any other uploads in that time slot for a long time. And I can just kind of focus on the other three time slots, the Pokemon time slot and the other two. And uh, yeah, but just FYI, Horizon Forbidden West is not going to be ending anytime soon. And you're just going to have to get used to that fact. Okay. Uh, variety content. So we just got started on the Collector's Corner stuff, which I didn't name it anything new. I just still put it as let's have a look at so-and-so. We've looked at Cubivore and uh, Duck Dodgers on the 64 thus far, two games that are really expensive and very hard to find. Um, the only way I'm denoting them as Collector's Corner is I'm putting a little icon in the corner. It's, it's literally the straight-up only for a Nintendo GameCube icon, just just ripped and then recolored and pasted over with CC. That's all I did to put that in the thumbnail. And uh, that is supposed to, just to note that these are games that we're specifically looking at because they are valuable. There's no other reason. It's not like anybody told me to go look at it. It's I haven't had any requests of any kind. I wasn't just like compelled because this is a game that I've wanted to play for a very long time or is interesting or is relevant or anything, those things. The only thing that separates Collector's Corner is these games go for high prices on eBay. Let's go see why they fetch such high prices and see if the games are actually any good or if they're so bad that they're good. And honestly, thus far, we've found some interesting stuff. I mean, that Duck Dodgers game was all right. It was a very serviceable N64 era platformer. It certainly wasn't bad by any means. Um, Cube of War wasn't very good, and I, I thought that was kind of a bad game. And there's a, there's another one that you'll be coming up in the next couple of weeks that I thought was very interesting, actually. A big cult classic game that I won't talk about right now for the PlayStation 2. Um, and, I, and I thought that was fascinating. And there's going to be a, told, a whole lot of more those that I'm going to be recording over the next several weeks. Um, I'm hoping to get like 40-something episodes done, which is probably enough variety episodes to tide us over, uh, honestly, pretty much through the year. So... Expect a lot of Collector's Corner for the next little while. Um, and I think once I get that many done, I will take a long break from it and then start to focus on a couple of other things. But yeah, that's pretty much the focus there as far as variety content is concerned at the moment. I kind of already talked about this last month, so I don't want to say too much on the matter. Now let's talk about Pikmin, because I did mention that last month that I was going to get Pikmin started in the middle of March, and I did. However, the series hasn't actually begun yet. Why is that? 
Well, a couple things. One, I don't know if I actually want to bring back that uh, time slot just yet, mainly just because of workload reasons and you know how busy I've been lately and the fact that I'm still trying to get ahead and I feel like I don't have enough of a cushion to try to add another, a fifth upload or a fifth series going on on any given week just to make stress me out even more. That was the same time slot that No Man's Sky was going up in, and honestly, I was very relieved to have that series done and over with. And then to bring back another series in its place would, just at the moment, doesn't really sound like a great idea. So, that, But that's not the reason that Pikmin hasn't started yet. The main reason Pikmin hasn't started is because of the game itself. So, I got started on it, I was recording it, and I, and I was playing the GameCube version, all right? And I want somebody to help me out with this. Um, this is kind of my call to action. Like, hey, does anybody know what the heck is going on here? Because it was driving me nuts. And I, I did my research, and I do know that this is a known glitch in the game, but it was something that I kept running into, and I don't know how to avoid it. Apparently, the first Pikmin has a severe issue with Pikmin interacting with geometry that they're not supposed to interact with. Um, this is particularly a problem when they are building things like bridges and ramps. Terrain that they can actually transform. And, I mean, there's really small terrain like twigs and sticks and things like that. And those aren't an issue because they don't have very big boxes on their models. But bridges and ramps are huge, uh, have these huge boxes. And the problem is, is that they go over terrain that at one point is, you are allowed to walk on it. And then once the bridges and ramps are built suddenly that terrain, you can't go under it anymore just because of that's the way the game is designed. So what will happen is you'll have, you'll set Pikmin about building these things, there's, to, you know, to open up a path for you, and then once they build it, if by, for any reason, in the process of building it, or as soon as they finished with it or something, if they go underneath the ramp or the bridge, they will just blip out of existence. And that will count as a death. You don't they don't just get lost into the void and trapped. They're just gone. The game's just like, oh, they're not here on the playing field anymore. Uh, they're dead. And then you just lose them. Now, this wouldn't be such an issue if this was only happening to one or two at a time, but every single time I ran into the problem, it was like dozens. Unless I explicitly only put a couple of Pikmin in that situation. And this, you know, this was like manageable. It wasn't too bad if I was able to like babysit them for a while and then like call my Pikmin back to me, I could mostly avoid it. But if I wasn't like actively babysitting them while they were doing this, a lot of times I would lose several Pikmin in the process. Even if there were no enemies around, they would just blip out of existence. And I know this because I literally watched it happen multiple times and there weren't any little Pikmin ghosts that would flutter out when like normal when the Pikmin are killed. They would just die. They're just gone. Vanished from the earth. And so... The, the, that, that was manageable with the bridges and the ramps, but I still want to know if there's a way to avoid it. Now, the real issue was in the boss fights. There were two particular bosses that I won't mention who move around a lot, and whenever they would, like, flip over or turn or, or, or put themselves in an area, and it wasn't necessarily an attack. It was usually, like, them just riding themselves or hopping to a different spot. This same glitch would occur where the boss would go where a group of my Pikmin were, and it, like I said, it wouldn't use an attack on them, it would just kind of end up there, or jump, or little, just waddle into that spot, and my Pikmin, like, wouldn't move, they would just kind of, like, I don't know, I don't know what they were doing, like, I, I would call them or I'd try to direct them over to me, but if any of them were caught in the spot where the boss was displacing itself, again, the same glitch, and this happened one time where like, I had a little crowd behind me because I was trying to use the Pikmin to do a lot of damage really quickly. And all the boss did was flip itself over and then like 40 of my Pikmin vanished in an instant. And I'm just like, okay, if this is an issue that is like constant, one, why don't people talk about this more? Because I've never really heard anything about it until I went and I actually looked it up. And apparently it's worse in the Wii version because I did try switching from the GameCube version to the Wii version, thinking it would be better. And I will admit the controls were better there, but the glitch was worse. Um, and apparently that's also a thing that's like known is that the Wii version like double, like it, the issue is like <laughs> absolutely exacerbated. I don't know why, but if anybody can like explain to me what's going on or how I'm supposed to avoid that or if there's a way around it or if there's something I'm doing wrong, 
I would very much like to know because I do want to actually make that series a thing. It's not like I'm just giving up on the game. I just don't know how to pl uh, play it without losing jar large swaths of Pikmin trying to do very basic tasks. And the fact that Pikmin is, by for all intents and purposes, an RTS, and, you know, in RTSs, you want to be able to set your units on doing specific things while you go and accomplish other tasks. And if I can't reasonably do that in an RTS, it's not that I'm saying it makes the game bad, although it is a problem. I'm just saying I need to know about that so that I can have the proper information when playing it so that I can deal with it, essentially. So if somebody could, like, you know, give me the lowdown on how big of a problem this is and how frequently it happens, do let me know how do I avoid it. That's really all there is to it. In the meantime, Pikmin is on hold. And that's it. That's all there is to that. All right. So let's talk Pokemon for a second. Let's go back to Pokemon Legends Arceus. Or more specifically, what's coming after Pokemon Legends Arceus. Now I planned, and I said this for many months, that my plan was to make Poke Park 2 be the successor to Pokemon Legends Arceus. And the more I thought about it, the less that made sense because that is going to be the beginning of generation five on this channel and for all intents and purposes i have i mean spin-off games not counting i have for the most part tried to keep things uh i tried to go over games generation by generation so the very first game we ever looked at in the pokemon series well main game was pokemon leaf green technically generation one it's a remake the next one was soul silver Again, technically a Generation 2 remake. Then came Pokemon Emerald, and, and then obviously we're just now ending Pokemon Legends Arceus, which, while not a Gen 4 remake, it is a Sinnoh Gen 4 inspired game, therefore I still kind of count it there, and it's more because I just am very cagey about trying to start a Let's Play of Pokemon Platinum when I am not uh, very adept and knowledgeable of that game versus all of the previous gens. So we'll get around to Platinum someday, trust me. I'm not going to just completely give up on it. But for right now, I've mostly kept things in order. And I want to keep going with Gen 5, but to start it with a spinoff in Poke Park 2 just kind of doesn't make a lot of sense, I guess. And I was thinking about it, and I'm just like, you know what, let's just... Let's just go. Let's just start with Pokemon White and Black and White already. Why not? Let's just jump into it. I mean, I've already been chomping at the bit in trying to get this series done since 2021, back when I recorded basically the entire Let's Play and then had half of my footage get corrupted on me because apparently my screen capture software was not working very well and it never... I, I mean, it is my fault for not ins manually inspecting the raw files after every single recording session, but it didn't make it any less frustrating and yeah i had to scrap the whole series and basically start over from scratch and it's like it's frustrating and i've it's been just sitting in the back of my mind for so long and i i just want to make it happen now it's time let's just let's play pokemon black and white the other main reason to get into it as quickly as possible is also so that i can then you know move on to the sequel as quickly as possible but i kind of want to pay homage to the time gap between those games, so that's obviously going to take a couple of years to do. I have some plans for kind of the holdover, and the main reason I'm paying homage to that time gap is because after Generation 5, we're a little stuck, and a lot of that has to come down to the fact that I don't have a 3DS capture card, I have no way to record 3DS games, so Generation 6 and 7 are just completely off limits to me at the moment. I mean... I could jump into Sword and Shield next. I know a lot of people would be a little iffy about that. Don't worry, I have a plan with that game, and I know what I want to do with Sword and Shield. But I also don't want to jump into that anytime soon. So that's what kind of complicates things. It's like after Black and White 1 and 2, it's like, then what? So I, I want to kind of put all the things we've missed sort of in between those games and uh, then we'll go from there. You know, stuff like the Mystery Dungeon series and going back to that, and then the Stadium games. Colosseum and XD Gale of Darkness are obviously going to be their own beasts. And uh, we'll, you know, we just have to, I just have to figure out how I want to do all of that. But the sooner I get to Pokemon Black and White, the sooner I get back to the actual main series, because believe it or not, it's already been, you know, if I don't count Legends Arceus, it's already been like three, almost four years since Pokemon Emerald. So, yeah, time to get into a new one. And uh, I've just. I'm just beating myself up over it at this point, so it needs to happen. But don't worry, I promise Poke Park 2 will be immediately after Pokemon Black and White. 
I do also want to say that, and, and don't just take this with a grain of salt, but there's a possibility black and white might be a couple of weeks delayed uh, just because I'm still working on actually getting it finished. And I don't know if the first couple of episodes are going to be quite ready for that because, you know, I've got I've got a lot of work to do with that series because I do want to make it look at least a bit nicer than even Pokemon Emerald looked. So that's going to take a little bit of additional work. And then on top of working a bunch of other things, yeah, it might be a little hard to actually make that deadline of, you know, only a few days after Legends Arceus ends, but we'll see. Uh, two more things I want to talk about, and then I want to end this with the Super Mario Brothers movie impressions. Um, first things, let's talk uh, Lightfall. So, Destiny Lightfall. I said last month I was going to make an impressions video on that, and I didn't. That is because I definitely jumped the gun on that game. My initial negative sounding reaction was mainly just due to the fact that the campaign's story was kind of crap. Um, it was honestly the worst story that Destiny has gotten since Destiny 2 Vanilla. But the story thing aside, that one aspect of the expansion aside, everything else about it is actually really, really good. And that the, just the storytelling is the only weak link. And while that is often, you know, often the case with Destiny, they've been getting a lot better over the years. So I think just coming off of something like The Witch Queen, where it was done incredibly well, to something like, like Lightfall was a bit off-putting and jarring and is kind of what is the reason behind my negative tone towards the expansion. But after playing it more, it turned out really good. And I don't want to spend an entire impressions video telling you why. If you need a full detailed breakdown, go watch the review for Lightfall on the channel Skill Up. He pretty much nailed down about 85% of my it, my impressions and thoughts on the expansion and um, there's a few things I disagreed with him in there but in large part most of the major stuff he kind of got perfectly so if you're really curious just go watch that video I'm not going to waste anybody's time I'd rather just save my thoughts on it for when we actually get there in the let's play for whoever however many years from now that takes so yeah not gonna not gonna jump into that but that's not happening anymore last thing before we talk about the Super Mario Brothers movie and this is something that is going to be a very down the road, not immediate concern thing, but someday this is going to be important. So I've obviously been making Let's Plays for a pretty long time on YouTube. And I haven't just been making Let's Plays for a long time, but I've been covering a lot of my all-time favorite games. In fact, many of the games that I've, you know, I played growing up are done for, done with on this channel we've we've looked at them they're all pretty much covered outside of a very small select few i mean i can seriously count on two hands the number of games that are were integral parts of my childhood and my formative years that i haven't looked at on this series even once so as time goes on and you know I, I want to continue to make these let's plays and these playthroughs don't get me wrong there will always be like new games and stuff that we could look at there's going to be you know, like we were talking about earlier, like with variety content where a game comes up and I'm just so enamored by it, it's like, I gotta play it. But based on the way that I do things here and also based on how my my standards for what I constitute as a game worthy of getting a full playthrough in a Let's Play and how picky I am, the well is bound to run dry within five to six years, honestly. And I think paving the way for that would uh, would be probably a smart idea starting now so over the past few weeks in my free time when i don't have time to record things and get stuff edited it's particularly when like videos are rendering and whatnot and i've my, my pc's hogged up and i don't got anything else to do i have been taking the time to do some writing and that writing has come in the form of reviews particularly reviews of games that i have already let's played on the channel and i have been thinking about it and while those let's plays are good and they, you know, they mostly get across what the game is about. They don't necessarily get across my thoughts on the game in, uh, I would say, the most detailed sense. Um, the most I give to those Let's Plays is usually when the credits start to roll at the end of a Let's Play, I'll kind of give like an impression. It's like, here's what I think about the game now that it's over. And it's not really a comprehensive review. It's just kind of me babbling on about what I'm thinking about the game in the moment. And I am terrible at coming up with thoughts and impressions on something in the moment. I usually need to ruminate on it a little bit, give it some time to think on it, let everything sit and stew before I am able to give a much more proper detailed uh, thoughts and analysis on something. And because of that, 
while you know, it's generally, I mean, it's pretty obvious that almost all the games I have done full playthroughs of this on this channel, I like them. I mean, there's, I, I can't name a single game that I have finished a Let's Play of that I actually dislike the game. I mean, there's a couple of them that were kind of meh, and there was a few that were very frustrating, and some that were, didn't leave the best taste in my mouth by the end, but I still like all those games at worst. So, in that regard, it's, I, you know, maybe I don't need to be saying all that much, but I have wanted to transition into reviews for a long time. Um, not completely, like I don't want to completely get rid of the Let's Play aspect, but eventually I'm not going to really have a choice. Like, I am going to run out of things to do when my standards are the way they are. And I'll talk about my approach to critique here in a second. And that's going to also be relevant to talking about the Super Mario Brothers movie in a bit. But with all of that in mind, I thought, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea to put out reviews of the games that I have talked about, um, the ones that I have Let's Played? Wouldn't that make the most sense? Wouldn't those be the prime candidates for good, solid retro reviews? Because let's face it, every single retro reviewer out there tries to go after what they know. I mean, yeah, there's the old retro reviewers that would just go after really bad games for, you know, the rage bait and whatnot. And then that was how they made their views back then, all those AVGN knockoffs. But there are other retro reviewers that tend to take a they, they tend to take a look at the games that they remember fondly growing up, the ones that they have the experience with. I mean, I, I think a lot of the best ones do anyway. And in that regard, I think it would be cool to, again, since there's a lot of overlap, it's all the Venn diagram is nearly a circle between games I've covered on this channel and my favorite games of all time. It would just make the most sense to start going after and taking a look back on all the games that I've Let's Played. And I thought, screw it, let's just do it in chronological order. Let's go all the way back to the beginning and uh, I'll just start reviewing those one by one. And in fact, I went through and I compiled all of the series that I've done in order. Uh, the If you go back and look through the playlist on my channel, it's a little out of whack, but I, I was able to mostly organize it and make it as accurate as possible. So like the first few that I've done, uh, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team, Super Mario Sunshine, Shadow of the Colossus, Warrior Land 4, Diddy Kong Racing, Super Monkey Ball 2, Super Mario Galaxy, The Unfinished Swan, Pokemon Leaf Green. Those are all of like the earliest series I ever done, and therefore they are going to be the first ones that I'm going to write up. I'm literally going to try to go through these in order from start to finish, and then I'll just use the gameplay and the footage from what I got in the series, and, and, and while playing through it again myself, of course, because I do want to make sure that I have a fresh take on everything and, and understand, you know, what's good about it, what's bad about it, talk about every single aspect of a game, and make like a 15 to 25 minute review on each and every single one of them. I'm not going to make these long form super analysis video essay things that you see on YouTube that are an hour and a half long on each and every game. No, I just want to do standard reviews, standard retro reviews, and just use these Let's Plays as kind of a springboard for that. In fact, it would be, I think, probably a good idea to sort of add those reviews to the end of each series as sort of an afterword, um, if you will, like something that just kind of wraps the whole thing up and, it with a, and ties it off with a neat little bow. Even if the series is so freaking old, like Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team that I was recording it on Ancient Equipment and it's aged incredibly poorly, um, it would still be nice to have that updated review and so we can all kind of look back on the game together. So I've already written the entire script for Red Rescue Team just to kind of give myself an idea of what I'm trying to go for. And then I use, I did a review for Super Mario Sunshine that I am almost done with the script for. And trying to get all the scripts for all of these done is obviously going to take me a very long time, probably more than a year to do because it's essentially multiple novels in length trying to go through all of these. So I'm not saying this is th anything that's going to happen anytime soon, but... It is something I would like to transition into possibly sometime next year. Um, if I can just get all the scripts done, the rest of it is obviously just getting all the footage and editing everything together. And uh, then we just go from there. And I don't know, maybe I could get to a point where these replace variety videos, where this is my weekly Friday upload of getting out one of these reviews. And with so many games to go over, I mean, the fact that we're going to be practically at 100 series by year's end means that that's a lot of reviews to go through. But it will also kind of make for a nice... Uh, it'll it'll kind of make for, I, I would suppose... If I can make that into the best content on my channel, the most editing intensive stuff on my channel, then, you know, and the best quality content that I can make it on my channel, then I guess that would be a good place to go once again, the well runs dry with Let's Plays and there's not much left to do. So that has been something I have been actively working on. I figured I would just kind of share it here and I will be continuing to work on it for the next very long while, hopefully. And then maybe, you know, maybe someday down the line, you'll start seeing some of those reviews. 
All right, let's talk movies. So, I just got back from seeing that in the theater late, late last night, and I've pretty much had an entire day to sit and think about the movie, and my impressions on it are pretty standard. Um, I want to, before I go into this, though, I want to talk about my approach to critique on things so that people can understand where I'm coming from when I make this discussion. But I do also want to say right off the bat, that I am very happy about this movie. I'm not saying I'm not saying right off the bat whether I love it or hate it, but I am going to say I am very happy that this movie exists because I said before, it feels like the bar for quality for video game adaptations in movies and television has significantly increased over the years. I, I noted this back when the 2018 Tomb Raider movie came out with Alicia Vikander. Now, by the way, that is not a good movie. It's not. But it is significantly better than the Angelina Jolie Tomb Raider movies of the early 2000s. It is certainly much closer to the source material than those movies and a lot more faithful, even if some aspects of it are very bad, like the acting is pretty awful in some areas. And uh, it's not a super well-directed movie and the cinematography is meh. I mean, it's not a super well like an extremely well-made movie or anything, but it's incredibly competent. And again, it's very faithful to the source material and actually gives a damn about this material that it's that it is, it is that is influencing it. I should say though that that Tomb Raider is based off of the reboot series and not the original Tomb Raider series, but I digress. So that movie kind of, to me, sort of set the stage on good video game adaptations. And Detective Pikachu, I think, bolstered that a little bit, even though that also wasn't necessarily an amazing movie or anything. Now, what really cemented the quality of these going up has been the Sonic movies. The first Sonic the Hedgehog movie was all right, uh, but I. I noticed something there when they decided to kind of stop everything after the manhog incident of those awful trailers came out and everyone was like, okay, you know what? We're going to take a step back. We're going to make this more faithful. We're going to make Sonic fans actually like the look of this character. They went back. They changed it. Yeah, it was probably not the most ethical thing in the world, but by the end of it, it came out to be a very a competent movie and competent enough movie for us to get a sequel that was actually good. I should say that is one of the best video game properties we've gotten yet was the second Sonic the Hedgehog movie. So, and then, you know, they're making a third one as well. So it's, so far, it's actually panned out really well. And that, I feel, has kind of cemented this quality. Then we got the Last of Us HBO series, which I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to talk about that next month. But just to give you an idea, that showed that a lot of love and care can really be put into these adaptations to truly make them something special and really appeal to movie going and TV watching audiences in a way that has never been considered before. We are a far cry now, officially, thankfully, from the days of Uwe Boll making Blood Rain and Hitman and these awful, awful movies back in the late 90s and early 2000s that were just driving these properties into the ground and beating them to a pulp. Uh, much like Uwe Boll likes to do with movie critics. hey -o. So with all of that in mind, and as a video game channel first and foremost, but also a, I, I, I think I've become over the last couple of years a little bit of a movie buff. I I do like to go to movies very frequently nowadays. When I was a kid growing up, I you know was lucky to see maybe two to three movies a year in a theater, in a movie theater. And now I go to about 20 movies a year in the theaters and then catch a bunch more on streaming. I like to actually look at a lot of the top movies of any given year. I, I care about that stuff pretty deeply now. I want to see what all the hype is about. And that's not to say I necessarily agree with a lot of those sorts of critics and a lot of the pompous uh, elitist Hollywood types necessarily, but I am somebody who has more and more over the years been, they kept more of my finger on the pulse of some of the best movies that Hollywood and the industry has to offer. I care about that stuff. I like movies a lot, a lot more than I would say I used to. Um, so I can be a bit of a harsh critic on these things and like I said, with video games, they were I just had been writing them off for so long because they, were, they weren't even trying. And now that they're actually trying, I'm going to be critical about it because, one, I care about the source material very deeply. But two, I am critical in a way that I don't think is 100% accurate to why other people are critical. A lot of people are critical, overly critical, because they feel like in doing so, it sends a message to the people that they are critiquing. It they think that if they uh, 
nitpick and they pull apart and they and pick apart something that they can make the industry better, perhaps. And there are some that definitely have that power. I mean, certain critics obviously do have a lot of pull, and I can tell you right now that there are people, you know, within the movie making business that give a that give a lot a lot of craps about what's said about their films. Don't get me wrong. I am not one of those people, though, because I'm just going to say right now, I'm not as talented as any of those people making those movies. I don't freaking know how to make a movie well. I don't know how to make games really well. I'm not good at any of that stuff. The only people that are even remotely associated to video games and movies that I could possibly say I have more talent than is those those loser executives that fail upwards all their lives by just because they were born into wealth and make all of the decisions that ruin movies and video games alike out of greed. Those are the only people I could say that I have, I could easily say I have more talent than uh, in, in that space. Anyone who's actually in the trenches, who's actually working on movies and video games, I cannot say that I'm even remotely as talented as any of they are. And I'm not gonna try to tell them that I know better than they do, because I don't. I don't, I also don't see what's going on behind the scenes, I just know what I like. However, I have a very low tolerance for mediocrity, and I do this because I am of the mind, and of what I think is a positive mindset, but I'm of the mind that there are a lot, a lot of amazing films and books and video games and TV series out there for people to experience. So many, in fact, that if you were to immerse yourself in those with every single hour of free time that you have, pretty much for the remainder of your life, you would never be able to experience all of them, especially with all of the new ones that are being made every single year. It's just impossible. And with that great wealth of selection available to us, and then you also have to consider that things are becoming easier to access than ever before. I mean, thanks to subscriptions and streaming services. And yeah, they also complicate things as well. But there's there are very easy ways to access a lot of the best material out there, a lot of the best entertainment that you could ever ask for uh, beyond just schlock. And because of that access and because of how many things there are, I think it is a waste of time to settle for mediocrity, to settle for the bad, instead of just trying to only indulge in the good, which is why typically when I run into something I don't like, I throw it away really quickly because I'm, I just don't care. I did, like, like I don't have time for you. I need to move on to something that's actually worth my time. Thank you. Life is only so short, essentially. That's why I'm a, I'm a super harsh critic. And now we can get into the Mario Brothers movie with that in mind. So when this movie was originally announced, it was... Not actually a huge red flag for me at first when they said that Illumination was partnered up. I know a lot of people rolled their eyes because they're like, oh my gosh, the people behind the Minions movies? I actually think Illumination is a pretty darn good animation studio. As far as 3D animations is concerned, they're one of the better ones. Uh, they really are. I mean, they're up towards the top of the list. Just because, you know, they do make obnoxious movies and very paint-by-numbers, by-committee style movies that are there just to sell tickets and appeal to kids doesn't mean that they're a bad animation studio. Of course, Mario Brothers is supposed to be kind of a paint-by-numbers, appeal-to-kids sort of movie, so that also makes sense. But Illumination has talent. They really do. They are good animators. The first Despicable Me is honestly a good film. I don't think it's bad. I think it's one of the better animated movies of the last... Oh gosh, how old is that movie at this point? I don't know. It was Of its era, it's one of the better animated kids' films. Um, the sequels are a little worse, and the Minions movie isn't all that great, and they're, yeah, they're annoying little shits, and I get that, but... I don't think Illumination inherently is a bad thing. I think them being attached to a project absolutely can be a good thing because they are talented, they are very good animators, and I have basically resigned myself to the fact that we are never going to be getting high-budget 2D animated movies ever again, which is a huge misfortune, and I just have to rely on indie studios for that. Obviously, that's what I would rather prefer, but it's never going to happen. And uh. Anyway, if we're going to get 3D animation, Illumination's fine. Then the voice actors got announced, and obviously that was a big meme. Now, I participated in all that, too. I was also joking at the fact that freaking Chris Pratt was going to be playing Mario, and Seth Rogen was going to be playing Donkey Kong, and I love Jack Black, don't get me wrong, but I still had to laugh when they announced him for Bowser, although I knew he was going to put all of his heart into the role, because that's just how he is, and he's awesome, and I have everybody respect for him. But... 
yeah, it didn't seem like it was the best idea. And then, of course, the trailers came out, and that was just like, eh, who cares? I mean, this just looks like such a standard kids movie. My expectations were for it were very low. I'll just say that much. I didn't think it was going to be a bad movie. I just thought it was going to be a very safe, a very sanitized, very standard sort of film. And that's exactly what it was. But you know what? It got the job done. It did a fine job, and I walked out of there having enjoyed myself. I, instead of trying to nitpick the movie and trying to find reasons to hate on it, I spent my entire time basically just looking out for the many Easter eggs that were sprinkled throughout the film and enjoying what we were given. I would give this movie uh, on, a, on, a, on an actual scale of w 1 to 10, not on the IGN scale of 1 to 10, but on an actual 1 to 10, I would give this movie probably a 6 which means that it is a slightly above average movie, <laughs> which is fine. It's fine. It's a fine movie. But there were some things that really bothered me about it, no matter how much I turned my brain off, and there were some things that were really good about it. First things first, my absolute favorite aspect of this movie was the animation and the world building to go with it. The way that this world was designed, or honestly both worlds, because the movie, and I'm, I don't want to spoil anything, I should mention that right now. Not going to do story spoilers. I'm just going to talk about like characters and things like that and very generic things. So if that's too much for you, click off now. But I'm, I'm not going to go into actual story spoilers. But they do have, and, and this was even mentioned in the trailers and some of the promotional material, there is parts of the movie that are in the Mushroom Kingdom and there are parts of the movies that are in uh, the real world, in our world. Both of those were honestly handled awesome. I was surprised at how well the real world stuff was actually handled. I wasn't expecting that. Um, and then the Mushroom Kingdom stuff was really good, too. They both were handled very well. It was just a nice visual treat for almost the entire movie. Honestly, the best work that Illumination has ever done. It was really incredible visually. Um, a lot of the gags, in fact, a lot of the best humor from the movie came from the visual aspects, and much less the actual writing and the delivery from the characters. That's honestly what had my attention throughout most of the movie, was just kind of looking at the backgrounds and how everything was animated and stylized. Because I am somebody who appreciates animation, but 3D animation kind of has been on my shit list lately, just because it feels like, you know, it's just taken over everything, and sometimes it's just like, they all blend together, even when they're very beautiful to look at. They just all blend together and you just don't care. But because there was so much pizzazz and style to this movie, there was so much more to look out for. And I really genuinely appreciated that. It actually reminded me a lot of something like Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs or the Lego movie, which I think are very, very good films and much better ver uh, better examples of how to do 3D animation right because of the amount of style that was within those sorts of movies. I'm not saying that the animation style was the same, but just how active and lively everything was. That was some, my favorite part of it. The voice acting was honestly better than I expected. I will say that. It was hit or miss here and there, but it was, it was better than I expected. There were a few that were not good. <laughs> and there were some that were honestly really great. Jack Black and Charlie Day out of the main cast were my absolute two favorites. Charlie Day honestly was like perfect to the character of Luigi. He was everything he needed to be and more. Honestly did a great job. Bowser was, I mean, for a lot of it, you honestly couldn't even tell that it was Jack Black. There were some scenes where it was decidedly Jack Black, and it was incredibly obvious that it was him. But that wasn't actually a bad thing either, because you could clearly tell that they were just sort of letting him do his thing. Which, in a movie that is otherwise that otherwise feels so tightly controlled, and again, so by committee, this honestly was... I mean, those scenes were honestly very refreshing. He was some, uh, had some of my favorite scenes in the movie, some of the only parts where I legitimately laughed at the writing came from him and his delivery. Charlie Day's Luigi didn't necessarily make me laugh, but he actually provided a lot of the more heartwarming scenes in the movie and did a very good job just with his delivery and whatnot. Chris Pratt was... there. There's two sides to this coin, okay? On the one hand, I think he did a lot better than I was expecting him to do. I think he actually, I, I can see now why he was so defensive about the entire ordeal and saying, you know what? No, you guys are all judging me from these trailers. This isn't very fair to me. I actually gave it my all here. And I can 100% believe that, that Chris Pratt was really giving his best performance that he possibly could with this character. The problem is, is that Chris Pratt is a live action actor. He's not a voice actor. And his absolute best was still not all that great. I mean, it was fine. He certainly 
provided a flavor and it didn't just sound like the Chris Pratt voice, but it wasn't anything spectacular. Part of that could be due to how the script was written because honestly, I could make the same criticism about Anya Taylor-Joy as Peach. They both were just characters that weren't asked to do a whole lot of inflection and a whole lot of a lot of ranges of emotion and whatnot. So it wasn't really hard. I mean, Anya Taylor-Joy and Chris Pratt, you, you could replace them with any actress or actor that's done any voice acting work. And honestly, you could get as good or better of a performance and not miss them for a second with both of them. Um, but... I think that's really just comes down to a fundamental misunderstanding that Hollywood has had for so long in that voice actors are not interchangeable with live action actors. There are not a lot of live action actors that can voice act super well. And the ones that do, most of the time it's because they're trained extremely well. Um, there's a reason why Disney and Pixar kind of get a pass on that is because at least, you know, especially in the early days, maybe not so much anymore, but certainly back in the 2000s, the 90s, and earlier than that, they were very, very good at training these actors to be better. And honestly, a lot of times, they would just straight up hire actors that are voice actors first and foremost, and not live action actors. But the ones they would get, they trained them very, very well to actually provide proper voice acting and you know come out of their comfort zone and out of their element and actually do an extra good job well nowadays a lot of times when a celebrity is cast into a animated movie they're just kind of slapped in there and expected to just add their voice to the role which isn't as exciting and i think chris pratt gave his all but i also don't think he was really given much to work with and he wasn't he doesn't have the chops for it, if that makes sense. So in that regard, he was just overall meh. Just like Anya Taylor-Joy was as Peach. She was just kind of meh. And you really could have gotten voice actors and voice actresses who did a much better job. But again, I think also some of that had to do with the line deliver, the lines they were given to deliver. The only outright bad one was Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong. That just didn't make any sense. It was just the Seth Rogen voice straight up. There, there, He added nothing to the character. He didn't even try really at all. There was even a part in the movie where he laughs and it's the Seth Rogen laugh that everybody memes about. Like it's just his voice. And that's all there was to it. There's also another character I won't spoil who's in the movie um, call, uh, who was played by Fred Armisen. And Fred Armisen actually usually does really good work. And I was shocked because that was probably the worst voice acting in the entire freaking show. I don't, I don't know why he was so bad because I know he's done very good stuff in other roles before, but he was just terrible in this movie. Like, absolutely terrible. I mean, it was some of the most flat delivery I've ever heard in my life. And every time he came on screen, I was just like... This is where the production really feels like it's dropping off. Him and Seth Rogen were the, the two standout worst parts of the film. But everyone else was serviceable to good. Oh, Keegan-Michael Key. I forgot to mention him. He was fine. Uh, he really just sounded like Keegan-Michael Key shouting into a microphone. He didn't really add a whole lot. Most of his character, I feel, was saved by the way that his character was animated as Toad. Um, that was really, I think, I mean, a lot of the best moments with Toad were actually moments where he didn't speak, where it was just a visual gag. Um, but the moments where he did speak, it was just kind of like, all right, yeah, that's Keegan-Michael Key, all right. And that's really all there was to it. So like I said, it's kind of all hit or miss across the board. It was fine. But I really do think that they could have gotten an actual proper voice acting cast. And aside from maybe two, maybe three performances, they could have replaced them with better voice, with actual proper voice actors. And it would have really improved the movie like significantly not even counting the writing, which I'm not even going to really get into the writing and the story all that much because what is there to say? This is a kid's movie. It is supposed to be an original uh, tale that talks about the Mario Brothers and the Mushroom Kingdom, and it's for kids, and that's all there is to it. I, If anybody is out there criticizing the story of this... I mean, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, that is that is not the reason that you should be bashing this movie because that is clearly the part that is the lowest common denominator in this exact specific scenario. If we were talking about something that was more geared towards, like, teenagers and adults, like, let's say this was a Legend of Zelda movie or a Metroid movie, then we'd have something to talk about. But because this is the Mario Brothers movie, miss me with that criticism. I do not care. Story was not something that bothered me at all. Yeah, it was... It was dumb. The, probably the only thing I would say is that it was a little rushed. Sometimes the movie would move along too fast from plot point to plot point that 
you felt like they could have added more in to make that stuff feel more weighty and meatier and meatier. Like they'd have moments, you know, typical beats that are t within most kids' stories, you know, as far as emotions are concerned, like where you need to convey this because this thing happened. And again, I'm not going to get any spoilers, but like you'll have typical writing tropes that were obviously in this because this wasn't written with, you know, a ton of creativity and originality in mind because it didn't need to be. And the thing would happen and then you were clearly supposed to like feel something in that moment because they wanted you to sit on it. But then because the story was moving so freaking fast that when the reveal came, it was like, oh man, that was literally 45 seconds of tension. You know, you know what I mean? Like it was so quick. It was so fast that you didn't even give time for the audience to like worry or wonder at all. Even if that audience is just a bunch of kids. Like I know kids have short attention spans, but come on <laughs> a little too much, too fast paced at points for me, in my opinion. The only thing I outright disliked in this movie has to do with the music. And this this one actually bothered me. And I feel like I've heard this criticism from a few people, but I'm just going to mention it because it, it was truly the worst part of the movie. So about 50 to 75 percent of the music in the movie was actually really good, although I do have a gripe with that as well. They used a lot of rearranged orchestral versions or just remixed versions of famous Mario Brothers tunes from Mario 1 to Mario 3. I heard a tune from Mario 64. I heard one from Mario Galaxy in there. I think there was one from Super Mario World as well, possibly, but it was mostly Mario 1 and Mario 3. And this is a, 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 the lesser criticism of the two, but I was a little bit saddened by the fact that it was almost exclusively Mario 1 and 3. Like, you got snippets of the other games, but it was really just those two games that you got the music from. And I was a little disappointed by that because there is so much music from Mario games that you could pull from that they didn't use for um, moments. And then they would sometimes repeat tunes from Mario 1 and Mario 3. And it felt like it just sort of oversaturated um, the soundtrack with those tunes, which is really unfortunate because the visuals did not have this problem. Yes, there, there were certain things in the visuals that were more referenced than others, but they referenced basically every single Mario game in this. I mean, I don't know if there was a Mario 2 reference, like a Mario 2 USA reference, but there was references to Mario 1, Mario 3, Mario World, Super Mario 3D Land, Sunshine, 64, Galaxy, Odyssey, almost every single Mario game, uh, 3D World, of course, but almost every single Mario game had representation from a visual standpoint in some way in this movie. But the music really didn't. It was really lacking. They would throw in like a 10, 15 second snippet from some of the other games. But like I said, almost all of it was Mario 1 and 3. And that was unfortunate. I really feel like they could have done a lot better. Heck, even take some from like some of the spinoff games. You take some of the frantic music from things like Mario Kart and some of the sports games and you could have used those in certain scenes instead of just throwing the Mario theme over an action scene or, or, a, or something where you know quick moments were supposed to be happening. But the most frustrating part was the licensed music because I don't know who the heck thought that was a good idea. That is like the most executive decision that I have ever seen in my life. But why in the world in this Mario movie about Mario Brothers featuring Mario music and visual Mario gags that is entirely 3D animated, do we have Beastie Boys songs and Take On Me by AHA playing in this movie? What the hell was that about? It was so jarring every single time it happened. It felt so out of place. These are songs that are so old that there is absolutely no way they are there to appeal to the kids who are watching this movie. They are designed exclusively for the parents, parents that are already going to be probably thinking along the same lines that I am, like, why is this in a Mario movie? And are probably, at if anything, just reminiscing over the nostalgia, or they're just like, why am I at a Mario movie? If they have no attachment to the series whatsoever. Like, that's the worst I can think of who are these songs for? Why were they in the movie at all? Especially when there was so much Mario music missing from the soundtrack as it was that they absolutely could have used. I think that's what bothered me so much. It wasn't just that they had licensed music in the movie. It's that they had licensed music in the movie when there was so much better choices that they absolutely could have taken from Nintendo and used instead. That was what was so frustrating. This is that was my by far my least favorite part about the movie was every single time those came on, and that's like a quarter of the soundtrack. Like twenty five percent of the soundtrack is licensed songs. Maybe like ten percent is all of the non Mario Brothers one and three songs, and then the rest is Mario Brothers one and three. Which 
that is what frustrated me. That was by far the most disappointing thing about this movie, more than anything. Even, you know, with Seth Rogen stinking it up and, you know, not being all that great of a, of a voice actor. Even that was, like, something I could tolerate, but I, I never rolled my eyes as hard nor as nor got as frustrated with what the movie was offering as I did when those licensed songs came on. I think that was honestly a big hindrance, a total, like, executive suits like decision that was just put in there because I don't know they probably wanted to make money off of those songs or something even though they're, they're probably the ones paying the licensees they just feel like every single animated movie is supposed to have those and you know what it, I, in other movies it actually kind of makes sense sometimes like you can throw that into a, like a despicable me and I wouldn't really be nearly as bothered as I would be in this specific instance where you are using a property that has a wealth of other options that you could choose from. That's, I think, what was so frustrating about it. I mean, like, it, it's it's like along the same lines as if they were making an animated Lord of the Rings movie or something like that. You know, this is a, something that has a very specific source material. This is not original, okay? Imagine if you were to take a Lord of the Rings movie. Not, I'm not talking, like, Thor or something like that. You took Lord of the Rings Return of the King, and then when Aragorn turns around and says for Frodo and he charged at the orc army, imagine if then they started playing Immigrant Song. Like, that's what the level of, like, no, you don't do that. <laughs> is what the, that That's what that felt like for the Mario Brothers movie. Obviously not with the same stakes, but it's just, like, it's that level of a, I don't understand the decision, if that makes sense. So, but... I guess to put it all into perspective, though, that one issue aside, I enjoyed the movie. I thought it was cute. I thought it was a good as a kid's movie. But more than anything, I'm just happy it's succeeding. I'm happy that this movie is actually, it's got a good reputation. I'm actually kind of happy, and I usually I'm not a fan of Nintendo fans who overblow things and act like every single thing Nintendo does is perfect until, you know, three months later they actually go, you know, maybe that wasn't so good. I'm not usually a fan of that, but in this one particular instance, I'm okay with it because I do want to see these succeed more because maybe it will inspire more. Maybe we'll start to see this become the new trend, and you know what? I'd actually be okay with that for a little bit. Maybe movie studios will start to take a little bit of a break from trying to ape the MCU formula and making everything into a cinematic universe, and maybe they'll go, hey, video game movies are the hot thing right now, and, and yeah, they'll probably run them into the ground and oversaturate things and whatnot and cause problems, but at least it'll be a change, you know? At least it'll be something different for a little while. At least it won't be you know, year 15 to 20 of superhero fatigue. Maybe we can start to see some more things come out of the woodworks. And, and you know what? If we get some good movies out of it, we get some really good properties, we get more Last of Us HBO series season ones out of this, and it starts to inspire more people because of Super Mario Brothers' success and that show's success, and them dunking, absolutely shitting on something like the Halo TV series, then I'm okay with it. Then I'm okay with it. Because we could use a change of pace, Video games could do deserve a little bit better representation in media, and hopefully, hopefully, the fact that both of these things heavily consulted with the original creators, you know, Mario Brothers movie was very much, you know, they were working in tandem with Nintendo this time, as opposed to what happened with the 93 Mario Brothers movie, and The Last of Us was literally co-wrote by the writer of The Last of Us game. It's when when you see that I have I just have a little bit more hope for what we might be getting in the future, and I'm hoping that whatever is in progress is being redirected and remade to better align with what we're getting here. That's I think the, my biggest takeaway from this. I'm I'm not about to tell you that Mario Brothers was like this amazing movie any and anything, but it's cute. It's got a lot of nostalgia to it. There was a lot of Easter eggs in there. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they actually referenced that. You know, like I had those moments in me for sure, even though I'm not usually one to do that. But I was just like, oh, that's nice. That's neat. They actually acknowledged it. They they because that was my biggest fear actually is that this Super Mario Brothers movie was only going to care about the latest thing. It was only going to care about 3D Land, 3D World, Odyssey, and then maybe like the original Mario's, like Mario One, Two, and Three, and that's it. And while the soundtrack kind of did that. The movie itself did not. It, it really did actually pay homage to all of the Mario source material, or most of the Mario source material. And that, I think, was what was my favorite part about it. So, with all that said, guys, I guess we're going to be done today. This is a long one. I apologize. I mean, tacking on a review to the end of this obviously made it a little bit longer, but there was already a lot to discuss this month as it is. So, with all that said, thank you all so very much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this one very much, and I will see you all in the next one.